Okay. 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 Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk more about my, about my recent paper. So uh, um, I will be talking about this recent exercise that I did where I looked at the spectral form factor for some simple quantum mechanical systems involving the uh, highly excited strings and pretty large engaged. Of course, the motivation of looking at this, um, looking at these theories comes from thinking about problems about black holes. So let me first say a few words about black holes. Um, so the spectral form factor, uh, as the, the way people usually define it, is the square of the analytically continued partition function. So usually people write it like this. And this z of beta plus i t is just the sum of eigenstate with e to the minus beta plus i t times the energy of n eigenstate. Okay, so it's just an analytically continued uh, partition function, and there are some often discussed property of this quantity. So if you plot the logarithm of this function, log of z squared as a function of log of the uh, time, log t, initially it decays. And this decay is governed by the coarse-grained density of state, a continuous density of state. But it doesn't decay forever. At some time, there is a linear contribution to the spectral form factor. So this is, for example, in SYK model or in JT gravity. There is a linear contribution, which is a signature of the random, random matrix uh, statistics of the spectrum, and at a very later uh, at a very late time, it saturates and becomes a flat hole. So this is this will be the curve that you get if you average over an ensemble theory. But of course, in a single member of the ensemble, there is a, a very large fluctuation at a later time. Okay. So this is the um, the spectral form factor where you define it as the uh, z squared. But uh, there is an important digression that I need to make. That is, sometimes it's better to consider a microcanonical version of the spectral form factor. So this quantity, I will denote it as the square of uh, quantity y. And this y quantity is defined as you also sum over the energy uh, eigenstate, but you choose a Gaussian window centered around some energy E with some width delta, okay? So basically it's a microcanonical version of the spectral form factor where you, uh, uh, you focus on the spectrum around some center energy E and with some width delta. So why do we want to consider this kind of uh, more complicated quantity rather than this simple canonical ensemble quantity? There are actually a few good reasons that uh, in general you want to consider this quantity. So let me uh, tell you a few of them. First reason is that um, if we consider uh, the, this canonical ensemble a spectral form factor for ADS black hole in higher dimensions, there is a Hawking cage transition. at t that is of order beta. That is a very short time if you consider this quantity z of beta plus i t, okay? So to see this um, is not, not difficult. Basically, we remind ourselves that if we look at the real axis of beta, so before we continue to beta plus i t, let's first look at how the partition function depends on real value of beta. Uh, famously, there is a Hawking page transition at some particular uh, so here I'm plotting as the inverse temperature. So it happens as some Hawking page inverse temperature. And when the inverse temperature is lower than this, that is the high temperature phase, uh, the, uh, the gravity answer is dominated by the black hole. While when the temperature is lower than this, the answer is dominated by thermal ADS, okay? So now let's uh, think of uh, this quantity z of beta plus i t, the question would simply be how does this transition on the real axis gets extended into the complex plane of beta? So the answer would actually be if you look at the complex plane of beta, 
this uh, first order transition becomes a line on the complex band, and it bends over to the uh, towards the high temperature uh, direction. Okay, so actually it becomes a, a curve on the complex band like this. Okay? So only in a very small region in the complex band, the answer is dominated by the black hole phase. While outside this region, the answer will actually be dominated by the thermal ADS phase. Now let's suppose we start with some value of beta here that at t equals to zero, the answer is dominated by the black hole. As you increase t, you soon transit into the thermal ADS phase. And this transition happens uh, uh, very quickly. It happens just at t of order beta. Okay. So this is basically saying if we want to focus on the black hole at a, a longer time scale, we would like to fix the energy window at some high energy window so that the thermal ADS set won't contribute and we can focus on the black hole. Okay, so that's the first uh, reason. And a uh, second reason, which is closely related to this first reason, is that it's based on the conservative Siegel criterion. for a uh, complex metric. Okay. So this is a crit criterion that is recently proposed to diagnose whether a complex metric is sensible to include in gravitational path integral or not. And the reason that it, it is relevant here is that uh, if we think of the geometry that computes Z of beta plus IT, in holography, uh, we fix the boundary length of the space time to be some complex number beta plus it, and then we look for a box solution, smooth box solution that fills in this boundary. Okay, and we know that at short time the geometry is simply given by a black hole. But a crucial point here is that to ensure that the geometry is smooth near the horizon, the structural radius also has to belong to uh, to be a complex number. And it depends on beta plus it. So you can look into uh, look at the near horizon region of this geometry and ask uh, whether it satisfies the conservative Siegel criterion or not. And that actually gives you a strong constraint. It tells you that when t is greater well, at a time that is also of order beta, the black hole becomes unallowable. Okay, so. This, this tells you that if you look at this zero beta plus IT quantity at a time that is fairly short, you don't trust the semi-classical computation anymore. And uh, there is also an interesting connection between point two and point one. That is, we can ask whether uh, at what time the black hole becomes unallowable in this picture. So it turns out that the black hole becomes unallowable uh, after it is domin dominated over by the thermal ADS settle. So basically in this picture, roughly the, uh, within this green curve, the black hole settle is still allowable while above this green curve or below this green curve, the black hole settle becomes unallowable, okay? How about if you compare it to the time in which Z of beta uh, stops being self-averaging? Um, is it, do we know that well enough to answer? Even at this time, um, I think Z of beta plus IT is still self averaging. Basically, it's still of order e to the n square. So it is still very large, not of order one. So I respect it's still self averaging. So it becomes unallowable one before it stops being self averaging? Yes. Is this completely independent of the setup? Or so, for example, in 3D, there, there are many other saddles, like some rotating black holes, and we're not tunneling into it. Yeah, so in 3D, there are rotating saddles that um, um, but each of them will have, well, I guess each of them will have a particular time that it becomes unallowable. Um, so this is for 2D or? This is for higher dimensional ADS okay. black holes. Yeah, like in ADS5. Sorry, but if you fix the metric in the boundary, you also have rotating solutions where you shift the angular velocity from zero to some integer values. So in even in higher dimensions, right? I don't know if those are the type of solutions. But I think like here I can focus on like uh, a micro canonical example in angular momentum. Yeah, if you fix so I fix the angular momentum to be zero. Yeah. 
Uh, the Probably in 3D as well. Yeah, I think, yeah. In 3D, you can also fix the angular momentum to be zero. Then you don't need to consider the other set of points. And this would be the, like the PTZ black hole will be the only set of points and it becomes unallowable at P of order theta. Um, okay, so on the other side, if you consider uh, the microcanonical example quantity, it turns out that it stays allowable even at a much, for, for all arbitrary time. Okay, so this quantity is always allowable. The way you uh, compute this quantity for the black hole is to write it uh, in a different form. So this y e of delta t can be written uh, equivalently as uh, this formula. Well, so I'm here I'm neglecting some factors of i and two pi. And this integral of beta should be along a imaginary axis. So this expression is also uh, appeared in the paper by Sashenka and Stanford. And so for a black hole, you could use this quantity and look for a settle point uh, in terms of beta. So you find that the settle point that you find always is within the allowable region of, uh, based on the conservative Siegel criteria. So these two, um, these two commas. So, so, so even if t becomes very large, when t becomes very large, beta also becomes large. Therefore, yes, beta also becomes large, but beta plus i t can still be yes. almost real. Okay. Yeah. So beta plus i t will uh, still be uh, within the allowable region. So these two, um, these two aspects tell you that if you want to focus on the black hole at a longer time scale, in general, it's better to consider a microcanonical ensemble quantity. And but for my purpose, there is actually a third reason where I uh, that I, I would like to consider this quantity. It's maybe more important is that this y quantity uh, decays very fast. much faster compared to the canonical example quantity. So we can see that it decays very fast just by consider a simple example. Let's uh, consider the case well, uh, the density of state, let's approximate the density of state by a continuous function. And let's just consider a toy example where well, that is a constant, let's say e to the s naught. So if this is e to the s naught, then we can simply compute y by, uh, so we replace the discrete sum by a continuous integral over the energy. So let's say some n e theta, and it will just be e to the minus e theta minus e square to the other square to the t okay, times e to the two s naught. And you see this is simply a Fourier transform of a Gaussian function. So a Fourier transform of a Gaussian function is still a Gaussian function. And that gives you some expression like e to the 2s naught minus um, something like delta square t square. Okay. So you'll see that this quantity uh, decays exponentially as a function of t square. So it decays very fast. Um, this fast decay doesn't depend too much on the, on, on the assumption that I've made here that the density of state is a constant. Even if it's not, not a constant, you still get a very fast decay. In particular, for ADS black hole in, for example, ADS5, it decays, uh, it has a similar exponential decay. So in, in this discussion, I will be uh, drawing uh, I will be plotting log of y well. That's a function of t. So for example, for uh, ADS5 black hole, I will also multiply it by g Newton. So that at early time will be some order one quantity, okay? So if you plot it like this, uh, this kind of computation tells you that initially it decays extremely fast and it decays, um, it soon crosses zero, okay? So let's say this curve is for the, it's a semi-classical computation using the black hole geometry. 
And um, the, the, the fact that the point that it crosses zero is very surprising because once it crosses zero, this quantity would be y, y squared would be of order e to the minus one over g newton. Okay? So that is a very, very small number. And that would be very surprising if it is true, because let me remind you that the y quantity is defined as a sum over exponentially many terms, where each term is a phase that is of order one. So you are summing an exponential many order one terms, and without a, a very delicate can cancellation, it will be uh, the answer won't be of order uh, won't be an exponentially small number. Okay. Of course, it's possible that some delicate cancellation happens, but we don't expect it to really happen for a chaotic systems such as the black hole, where the uh, spectrum should be generic. Okay. Of course, in the literature, as uh, uh, Phil said and uh, uh, Shankar and Stanford, they pointed out that there are other contribution uh, potentially for the spectral form factor. So they pointed out that the wormhole can give you a, a linear um, growth in the spectral form factor. So in, in this curve, in this picture, I shouldn't really draw it as linear uh, because the horizontal axis is T. But they point out there are some rising uh, contribution to the spectral form factor. Okay. But I still want to emphasize that it's not entirely clear that the range should already come in at this early time. So remember that the time that it crosses zero is of order one. To see that it is of order one, let's remember the, uh, how this various parameter depends on uh, the Newton's constant. So for a, for a black hole, the entropy is, is of order one over G Newton. And in this talk, I will be choosing delta to be of order one over square root of G Newton. This is a natural choice because Let's say you consider a thermal ensemble, the typical energy fluctuation in the thermal ensemble is also of order one over square root of Newton. So if you choose it like this, um, at a t that is at a time that is of order one, this y square quantity already becomes uh, exponentially small. So it's not clear whether the ramp already comes in at this very early time or there can be some other intermediate phase in between and eventually it transits into the ramp. So these are kind of questions that I had in mind when I uh, started looking at this. And this is a challenge to the discreteness of the spectrum at a very early time, uh, order one time. So uh, a natural idea was to look at some simple uh, quantum systems to see uh, what happens to the spectral form factor. So I will be uh, telling you something about what happens in these simple quantum systems, including highly excited strings and free large and data. So I will be uh, mostly focused on uh, the string case and I will discuss the gauge theory case by drawing some analogy to the string case. Uh, the basic structure is quite similar. Um, before I start, let me just make some comments about these, these simple quantum systems. Okay? So first comment is that there is no uh, random matrix statistics, at least in the free theory. So uh, let me just draw it again. So we don't expect to find a rent in the spectral form factor, but um, they do have discreteness in the spectrum. The spectrum of them, of course, is still discrete. We're doing free large n? Yes, we're doing free large n H2. They do have a discrete spectrum. And um, so if you look at, if you naively think of their spectral form factor, at early time, of course, it also decays. But since 
these are systems that do have a discrete spectrum. You expect something to come in to prevent the, the spectral form factor from becoming exponentially small, or in this picture, from becoming uh, negative. Okay. And we would like to understand what is the physical mechanism for uh, mechanism for, for, for that to happen. And uh, third point is that, um, okay, these systems, we, in principle, we know the spectrum. We know the microstates. So that is a big difference from the black hole problem. We don't really know what are the states of the black hole, but these are completely explicit systems, so we know the microstates. So you could say that, okay, I just compute the spectral form factor maybe on the computer, so what is to learn about it, right? But a slightly uh, more non-trivial fact about these systems is that there are some analogy of geometries in this system. So in these systems, we can compute the spectral form factor by uh, phrasing the question in terms of some geometrical quantities, which I will explain in more detail later. And if you think of these quantities, the discreteness of the spectrum will be obscure, will not be manifest. And we want to see how this, um, how some new geometries show up and prevent the spectral form factor from becoming uh, exponentially small. Okay. So let me just now start to talk about what happens for a gas of stream. So this problem, you can either consider it in the free stream limit, namely you turn, uh, you set the Newton's constant to be zero, so that is literally free string, or you can consider a, a little bit of gravity interaction, which I will talk about later. But the question we're asking is a very simple uh, physical problem that you consider a highly excited uh, gas of string, a very complicated object in the Lorentzian space time, and you compute its spectral form vector. Okay. So about this, this system, there is a well known, uh, well known property that at high a high energy, the density of state asymptotically behaves as a hexagon growth. So it, it grows exponentially as a function of the energy with the coefficient that is the inverse hexagon temperature. So that is, you can get this just by counting states uh, explicitly in the Lorentzian signature. But there is a, what I will call a geometrical correspondence of this, which I will make more precise later. Instead of thinking about the string in the Lorentzian signature, let's think about the string theory on uh, S1 times the transverse space. In this case, it would just be flat space. So you consider a string theory S1 times, for example, uh, let, let me just consider bosonic string. So, let me, let me say the following. So this discussion is better done in uh, superstring because uh, the existence of tachyon in bosonic spectrum will make some of the statement I will make later force. But to keep things simple, let me just discuss in, in bosonic string. You can find the detail about superstring in my paper. So let's say a 25 dimensional uh, flat space. And to really have a discrete spectrum, let me also consider it on a torus, not, not on a non compact space. Otherwise, the momentum will make the uh, spectrum not, uh, not discrete, okay? So if you consider the string theory uh, on this manifold, uh, there is a winding mode. So you can have a string that winds the thermal direction. So there is a winding mode on this, uh, on this geometry. And actually, you have a winding mode that winds in the clockwise direction and the other on the end of Counterclockwise direction. So you have two scalar fields, and they have the property that their mass square is proportional to beta square minus beta hexagon square. Okay. So these are two scalar fields that become uh, massless when you approach the inverse hexagon temperature. So these two uh, string modes are closely tied to this behavior of the. Uh, asymptotic density of state. Namely, let's consider the effective theory of these uh, two scalar fields propagating on this background. In the free, um, free field limit, the partition function C of beta will have a one loop term that goes like beta minus beta hexagon. 
So you have a, a beta minus beta hexagon because you have two fields. And this is uh, directly tied to the fact that this singularity at beta hexagon is directly tied to the fact that you have an exponentially growing energy. Okay. So this is just saying that some property of the uh, of the uh, energy spectrum in the Lorentz signature can be characterized by the winding modes on the uh, thermal manifold. So if you just use this continuous density of say e to the uh, beta hexagon e, of course you get a decaying curve in the spectral form vector and it decays forever, okay? And it is incorrect, of course, when it, after it crosses zero because we don't expect that to ever happen for a discrete spectrum. Then the question is, what 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 saves the day? What 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 happens to uh, prevent it from becoming exponentially small? And um, we would like to understand how to explain the growth of the spectral form factor using the language of the winding modes, okay? Using these geometrical quantities. So at this moment, the notion about geometry is very vague, but thanks to uh, Horowitz and Pochinsky, there is a literal connection to geometries. So with a little bit very small uh, gravity interaction, there is an actual geometry. In uh, let's say the, when the there are four large dimensions in D equals to four, um, due to Horowitz and Pochinsky. So that that is what I would call the uh, Horowitz Pochinsky solution. So it's a solution um, that solves the classical equation of motions of string theory on this uh, space time that is S one times some uh, flat space and. It is a solution which involves a condensate of these two scalar fields. So in this solution, the value of these two scalar fields will be non-zero. And this solution is in many aspects conceptually similar to the black hole solution uh, in the following sense. So this solution, if you use the gibbons hawking procedure, It gives you the correct uh, asymptotic density of state for a highly excited string in the Lorenzian signature. But on the other hand, this solution itself also doesn't give you the microstates. Not only doesn't give you the microstate, also doesn't even tell you that the spectrum of the system is discrete. Okay. Um, excuse me. Yes. Uh, this solution is in real flat space, not on a torus. So I don't know exactly what you mean in the context of, of the completely compactified T25. Oh, and what I meant is that there are three directions in T25 that are very large, and you can approximate the three of them as flat space because this solution is a localized solution. And I imagine that the other directions are compatified on a torus that is of scale that is of order the string length, while there are three directions that are very large. I see. Okay. For you okay. to consider, just consider R three, and since this object, this Horowitz Pochinsky solution, it is a localized object, so we do expect it has a discrete spectrum, even though it's in R three, but it's like a. a object that is localized like a star. You have to ignore the tendency to evaporate if you want to claim it as a discrete. Right, yes. I mean, on the torus, could it be that there is a solution with where chi is constant? Um, so we imagine we have a, like a quartic potential solution at the maximum. Mm -hmm. I think we have trouble solving the equations on the torus section because there's a massless mode that couples to chi squared. So if we give chi a we can't solve the equation. So in mm -hmm. general, R3, there's a long range field. Right, right. Um. 
just let me just say that I consider in S one times R three times T twenty two. Okay, does that answer the question? Um, anyway, what I was saying is that it is conceptually uh, similar to the black hole that this classical solution doesn't give you uh, microstates or discreteness of the spectrum. So you have a similar problem as the black hole. Namely, if you consider compute uh, the spectral form factor for the horowitz potency solution, which uh, you can do explicitly because we know the action of the horowitz potency solution. Uh, you get a decaying curve much similar to the black hole, and it crosses zero at a time that is of order one. Okay, it doesn't depend on the Newton's constant, so it's a time of order one. So that uh, that is a problem. So just by considering a Horowitz Poisson solution at a later time, you get a contradiction uh, with the discreteness of the spectrum. So I would like to understand what you need to add to the horowitz poczynski solution in order to uh, respect the discreteness of the spectrum for a highly steady stream gas. So, okay. So let me tell you what, um, so to solve this problem, uh, we can first retreat ourselves uh, to the free stream limit namely we ignore all the gravity interaction. Uh, the reason is that in the free string limit, of course, we know that it's spectrum explicitly. So one fun thing you can do is to just use the string spectrum and plug it into a computer and see what the answer really look like. So here, let me tell you what, what is the answer that you will get by consider, considering a single highly excited string and uh, compute the spectral form factor. So at early time, it, uh, it set, well, at early time, it agrees with the prediction from the winding mode. Namely, this early time curve can be produced, but just by considering the continuous density of state, the high energy, which corresponds to the winding mode with winding number plus minus y and a momentum zero. So the momentum means the momentum along the time direction that is zero. But if you plug it into a computer, you see it turns at some time that is of order one. And it starts growing. Okay, it has a very linear, a very slow linear growth. In, in, if you plot it uh, in terms of t, of course, I should stress this has nothing to do with the linear growth in the ren, uh, because this is t, not a log t, and also there is no random matrix statistics in this system. And it has a slow growth. Um, and if you zoom in into the this linear growth uh, region, you actually see. Uh, set, uh, bumps one after another, okay? And the spacing between the bumps becomes more and more. So that is what you actually see from uh, numerics. And the, now I would like to explain how to get this answer uh, using the language of the winding mode. Okay. So to explain it, let me, uh, let me first- That literally came from- uh, the spectrum of a single string spectrum? Yeah, this is the coming, just coming from the spectrum of a single string, single highly excited string. Um, there, there is argument that I made in the paper that if you consider multi-strings, uh, the leading behavior, so the dominant contribution will still come from a single string. But there are sub-leading corrections if you consider multi -string. Um, Okay, so this is so let me make a detour to talk a little bit about the free string partition function. The purpose of this will be uh, clear soon. So I would denote this as C of three as a function of beta, okay? And um, just to make everything explicit, this is nothing but uh, the partition function for a bunch of the infinite number of identical bosons. So let me consider the bosonic string so there is no fermions. Okay. So you sum over all the different mass of the string mode 
And this D factor corresponds to degeneracy uh, with a corresponding mass. So this mass are of course just by, uh, giving, uh, given by the free string uh, formula. Okay. So you have this expression, which is completely explicit, but um, one interesting uh, property that I will uh, want to use is what is the analytically uh, analytical structure of this function z of z free beta in the complex plane of beta. So let me consider the uh, analytic structure of this function on the complex plane. And as I told you earlier, there is a pole at the inverse hagedorn temperature, beta hagedorn. Okay, and this function, of course, it is only convergent when you are to the right of this uh, this line, because the asymptotically, or I erase that, but asymptotically the energy grows exponentially. So um, naively, it will on only be convergent there. But an interesting uh, thing that was discussed in a paper by these people. Let me just write down. In 89 is to consider the analytic continuation of this function to the region where it doesn't uh, naively converge. Okay, so you analytic, analytically continue this function from the uh, convergent region to the uh, unconvergent region. And the interesting behavior you, you discover is that it has many singularities, many poles. At other locations on the complex plane. So let me just uh, draw some of them. Okay, so it has many poles. And since the, uh, so they did a careful analysis in their paper, but the answer is very simple to understand. Whenever you have a pole, you can understand that as a particular winding mode becomes massless uh, uh, in the target space. That is S1 times uh, R22. Okay, so. So when does a winding mode become massless? To, uh, to see that, we need to use the mass formula of the winding mode in the target space. So the mass of some winding mode is given by um, 2 pi n over some beta tilde as well plus um, winding times beta tilde. Okay, so in principle, you should, since I compatify the theory on some torus, you also have contribution from the momentum and winding from the spatial direction, but let me just suppress it. So this is the, uh, the mass of a winding mode on the target space with some momentum along the time direction n and winding around the time direction uh, w, okay? And if you look at this equation and we demand it to be zero, you get an equation for beta tilde, and it turns out that most of the solution to this equation will be on the complex plane, not on the real axis. Of course, there are some uh, special solutions on the real axis. For example, there is a solution at beta over beta hagedorn over two that corresponds to a winding mode with uh, winding number two or minus two, but with no momentum. Okay, and there is a family of higher winding mode on the real axis, but more generally. The momentum doesn't have to be zero. Also, the oscillator numbers also doesn't have uh, don't have to be zero, and you get an infinite number of singularities on the complex plane. And the property of that is that all of the real part of these singularities are smaller than beta hagedorn. Okay, and in fact, as I will tell you later, uh, the largest real part of the other singularities are beta uh, or beta hagedorn over two. That is just something you can show explicitly. Okay, so the claim in their paper was that uh, the, all the poles in this function correspond to the places where some of the winding mode becomes massless. So that is the claim. And why are these singularities or poles uh, interesting? Okay, 
what, what does they uh, what do they have to do with the uh, spectral form then? So, so let me first discuss uh, their consequence on the density of state rho of e. So as we know that the density of state can be written exactly as an inverse Laplace transformation of the uh, partition function. So here again, I'm suppressing i's and two pi's. So it's given by this formula, and importantly, this integral of the beta is along the imaginary axis where the real part should be greater than any of the singularities. So you integrate over beta along this imaginary line. And once you write down this formula, it's clear that what are the consequences of all these singularities. The idea is to deform the contour leftwards. So you deform it. Let's say you deform it uh, like this. And then you will pick up contributions from all these poles. Okay? For example, this pole at beta hagedon gives you simply rho of e as e to the beta hagedon times the energy. But as I told you, there are many other singularities. And their effect is to give you rho of e that uh, goes like e to the beta tilde, that is the location of the pole, times the energy. Okay. So they give you these uh, subleading contributions. These are exponentially suppressed compared to the leading density of state because once I consider high energy, since the real part of beta tilde is smaller than beta hagedon, these are exponentially suppressed compared to these. So when you usually consider thermodynamics, you don't really need to worry about these uh, subleading corrections or exponentially suppressed uh, contributions. But now the point is that these are important once you consider the spectral form factor. So as I told you earlier, the spectral form factor has an expression that goes like d beta e to the beta e plus one half beta square or delta square c of beta plus i t. And you can use a similar contour deformation argument to see what the contribution from uh, each of these singularity is. So let me just write down the answer. The answer is that uh, the pole at beta tilde gives you uh, y squared So that, that would be the contribution from the pole at beta tilde. And if you look at this formula, you see that it has the property that. What is, sorry, what is beta coming? Oh, oh, no, no, sorry. Why do we need Yeah, why, why depends on t. Um, oh, sorry, this should be this should be y, not y squared. So this, this, this should be y. OK. And if you look at this formula, you could see that if you consider y squared, the maximum locates at t equals to the imaginary part of beta tilde. Okay. So the contribution from the pole at beta tilde will give you a, a, a contribution to the spectral form factor, which peaks at not t equals to zero, but some finite time that is that equals to the imaginary part of beta tilde. Okay. And at the peak, the contribution would be y squared equals to uh, exponential two times the real part of beta tilde plus um, the real part well delta squared. So at the peak, you see that the dominant contribution will come from the singularities with large, largest real parts. Because the larger the real part is, the contribution at the peak will be larger. Okay. 
So with these two facts, we can basically understand the structure in the spectral form factor that I showed you earlier. Basically, each of those bumps correspond to the place, correspond to each of these singularities. And at each of these singularities, some winding modes becomes massless. Okay. But um, so to really understand what those all, uh, what's going on in bosonic string theory, we just need to know what, uh, what is the actual distribution of the singularities on the complex pen. So actually in bosonic string theory, as I said, there is a, uh, there is a particular singularity at beta hamilton, and there are infinite many uh, singularities that are located at a line where their real part is beta hamilton over two, okay? And to the right of this line, there are no more singularities. So as I told you earlier, since at the peak, the singularities with a larger real part will give you a dominant contribution to the spectral form factor, we are mostly interested in, in the singularities that are most to the right, namely the singularities that are on this line. Then we can ask what are the corresponding winding modes that are responsible for each of these singularities. And so let me first write down the value of these singularities. So the value of the singularity is given by two pi square root alpha, one plus minus i times some n, let's say n left minus one. And this n left is the left moving oscillator mode uh, on the wall sheet. And n right in this solution would be equal to zero. There is a similar solution where you exchange left and right, but let me now write that down. And the momentum of this winding mode uh, will not be zero because of the level matching condition. It has to be, uh, I think, plus minus and left. And the winding mode uh, and the winding number of this mode is just plus minus one. Okay. So it corresponds to uh, some string that winds around the thermal circle once, but it also oscillates in the transverse direction. And at the same time, it moves, uh, it moves in the time direction. So that's basically the string mode, uh, string modes that are responsible for these singularities. And now, since all these string modes have the same real part of beta tilde, naively they should give the same contribution to the spectral form factor because uh, it, only the real part appears in this formula at the peak. But as I told you that if you really plot the free string answer, you see that it has a slowly rising behavior. So what, how to explain that? The, the explanation is very simple. Simply, when you increase the imaginary part of beta tilde, the oscillator number in, increases. So there is a larger and larger degeneracy of the stream modes that becomes massless at a particular beta tilde. So that degeneracy factor simply gives you a, a slow but steady uh, linear increase in, in that curve. Okay. So, um, okay. so this is basically the explanation of the structure in the spectral form factor for, uh, for free string. So now we can take one step further and uh, ask, now what happens if I add back a little bit of gravity interaction? Okay. I mean, doesn't the degeneracy go like e to the root n? So wouldn't uh, that translate into not a linear slope, but like a square root behavior of the-, of the Right, of the degeneracy goes like e to the uh, square root n. Yeah. And so that there I am plotting log of y. So log of y would grow like square root n, okay? And since the time here, as I said, the time is proportional to the imaginary, is equal to the yeah. part. So that is uh, proportional to the, to the time with some coefficient that is order one uh, in alpha prime. Mm -hmm. So that explains the uh, linear growth behavior. So what happens now if you add back a little bit of interaction? As Horowitz and Poshinsky told us, the, that uh, early part of the curve will just simply turn into the curve that is given by the horowitz poshinsky solution. Now, uh, it's, it seems very natural to suggest that the later part of the curve 
will be given by a family of other classical solutions. Okay. So the net part of curve will be given by a family of classical solutions. And these are classical solutions that uh, are the generalization of the horowitz potentis solution. But for the other winding mode that shows up in the later part of the spectral form factor. So for example, these winding modes are, they, are, they become massless as some complex value of beta or as some beta tutor that, that is complex. So to construct this analog of horowitz potentis solution, you would fix the boundary length of the space time to be some complex number beta tutor, but that number should be uh, to fix it to be some complex number that are very close to the value where it becomes massless. And by similar construction as the horowitz potentis solution, it seems very reasonable that these classical solutions will also uh, exist. So there are two reasons will, for which I find this um, very plausible. The first reason is that we expect no phase transition. between free string uh, and small G Newton limit, okay? So physically, the, what, what happens as suggested by Horowitz potency is just that the gravity attraction becomes very, it's very weak, but it is just slightly strong enough to pull the string together to form as a dense, dense object like a star. And we don't expect that the qualitative behavior in the uh, spectral form factor to change dramatically, okay? So that's the first reason that you still expect a similar uh, a rising behavior. And the second reason is based on the universal universality um, in the construction of the horowitz potency solution. So in the construction of horowitz potency solution, the only important coupling is between uh, the string mode that you have in mind, let's say, uh, let's still use the notation chi and the so-called radian, namely the massless field that describes the fluctuation of the size of the thermal circle. And this particular coupling will be the same uh, for each of the string modes that I just mentioned earlier, okay? And for the whole for changing solution, there is an argument where you can make to, uh, that says that, for example, the chi to the fourth coupling is negligible compared to this coupling at long distances. So I would expect that similar argument like that still hold for the other string mode. Of course, in general, um, we don't expect the canonical example to make sense uh, for these string modes because they have a thermal circle. To, to find the solution, you need to fix the thermal circle at infinity to be a value whose real part is already smaller than the Hagelin, inverse Hagelin temperature. But I think it makes sense to use that to construct the solution and interpret that as a solution in the microcanonical example. Now, let's say that this solution uh, exists. You can also apply the Gibbons Hawking procedure, and each of them will give you the corresponding, or oh, I erase that, they will give you the corresponding uh, density of state e to the beta uh, tilde e. Okay. So, let me see. Right. So this is uh, what I think should happen once you have a very small interaction. But, okay. Uh, maybe let me, let me say one more point about this. Oh, it's here. So as you go towards later and later time, the spacing between these similarities becomes smaller and smaller. For the whole race potentials construction, at least their construction to hold, um, you need to be close to a singularity to fix the boundary length close to the singularity, but not too close to the singularity. Because based on an argument that uh, in, in my paper with uh, Huang and Edward, once you are too close to the singularity, uh, the quantum fluctuations become large around that classical solution, and you don't trust the solution anymore. So I would expect that the construction, this, this uh, behavior that I'm proposing to break down at some time that is of order one over G string to some particular power, which I didn't write down here, uh, because 
as you go towards later time, the spacing becomes smaller and smaller, and eventually becomes of order uh, of order the strings of order. The spacing becomes some positive power of G string, so that you cannot be close to just one of the singularity. You will be close to many singularities. Then the at least the uh, construction by Horowitz and Pochinsky will break down there. And I don't know what will happen in terms of this curve uh, once you reach that time scale. So that time scale will be some time scale that is over one of G3 into some positive power. Maybe at that time scale, you are looking at uh, smaller and smaller, uh, looking at finer and finer detail in the spectrum. And maybe the interaction effect will become stronger and stronger. And one conjecture is that maybe the spectrum will have some properties that look more like a random matrix statistic, and the curve will start to fluctuate uh, more there. But I don't have uh, concrete things to say about that at the moment. Okay, and one last comment about this is that you might wonder what is the implication in terms of the black hole string transition. So as was discussed recently, we could wonder whether the horowitz Pochinsky solution as you increase energy uh, turns into the black hole of course, there is a question whether that transition can be a smooth one or it must be some phase transition. But we do know that uh, once you increase the energy, this curve should be replaced by the black hole. But of course, since we don't know about the detail of the transition good, well enough, I'm not sure what, whether there is a similar statement for the later part or for some mysterious reasons, mysterious reasons this later part just disappeared for the black hole. And you simply get a uh, grow uh, initial decay that uh, decays to almost zero, and maybe there are some large fluctuations at later times. Okay. Um, okay. So I will just uh, talk a little bit about the gauge because uh, maybe use ten minutes. Okay. Uh, I have one question. Yes. So the, the solutions had some momentum, right? Yes. So would you think that there would be a black hole solution, which also breaks the one symmetry in the circle. Yeah, yeah, I don't have concrete things to say about that, yeah. Um, even, even, even though this solution has this uh, momentum symmetry, uh, sorry, moment, momentum number, I think, for example, if you consider the square of the field, like chi times chi star, I think maybe that is still time translation invariant. Yeah, it's very, it seems very mysterious what, what the black hole analog of this would be. Okay. What you're saying in the last comment is that you have translation symmetry up to a rotation of time. Yes. Um, okay, so, so let me just discuss a little bit about the gauge theory uh, discussion, just by drawing some analog because well, as we know that gauge theory and strings, they show many common features. And in free large and gauge theories, so let me just draw some analogs. For strings, the crucial uh, phenomena is the uh, appearance of other winding modes that uh, are important in the spectral form factor. So the winding mode plays the role as uh, some geometry here. So you have winding modes, for example, one is the chi field, and uh, there are many other winding modes. And for large and gauge theory, for congruence, let me just say, uh, let's just discuss UN gauge theory with only a joint beta field. Okay. The analog of winding modes uh, would be the thermal holonomy. We will also consider the gauge theory not in the Lorentzian space time, but in the Euclidean manifold where time is again a circle data. But here I will again take the spatial direction to be compact. And the thermal holonomy is a Wilson loop that wraps the uh, Euclidean time direction. In other words, I will denote by U and it's a it's this form. A tau, a tau from zero to beta. Of course, um, more technically, uh, 
for, for other purposes, I will consider this gauge field to be the zero mode of the gauge field on the spatial directions. So you smear this gauge field on the spatial manifold. And the analog of different winding mode uh, in the gauge theory is different moments of the thermal holonomy. So for example, the, the, the first moment, namely the trace of U, is what's also called the polyarctic loop. And it's an important uh, order parameter to diagnose the confinement deconfinement transition. But in general, you could consider higher moments as well, for example, trace U squared, uh, et cetera. Okay? So this plays the role as the analog of different winding modes here. Um, and in the gauge theory, you could also, since this is just an n by n unitary matrix, you could consider all its eigenvalues and there will be phases e to the i theta one to e to the i theta n. And another way to uh, characterize this matrix is to look at the eigenvalue distribution rho of theta, namely the distribution of these angles uh, on the, uh, from zero to two pi. So theta belongs to the zero to two pi. Okay, so these different eigenvalue distributions would be the analog of geometry in, in this setup. And now, for a free large and gauge theory, there are some, uh, the, basic, the basic idea is that as shown in a paper by Aharoni and, and collaborators, the thermal partition function of a free large and gauge theory can be written exactly as a matrix integral of this thermal holonomy with some action S of u, of course, it also depends on beta. And this action is exactly known for a free gauge theory. Okay. Um, and so natural idea is that in a large end limit, we look for settle point of this matrix integral. And that can be phrased in terms of the settle point solution of this eigenvalue distribution. Of course. Let me emphasize that this eigenvalue distribution has nothing to do with the physical eigenvalue distribution. It's the distribution of these angles, theta one to theta n. And there are some well-known geometries in, in this system. Let, let, me, let me call that geometry, but there are uh, these eigenvalue distributions. Namely, even in the, in the limit where the coupling is, is is zero, there is still a hadron transition that happens at some uh, inverse temperature beta hadron. So again, let's look at the real axis of beta hadron. In the low temperature phase that is at, uh, for large beta, the settle point uh, solution of this uh, matrix integral is given by a completely flat eigenvalue distribution. That means rho theta is just one over two pi. So I'm normalizing that it is integral is one. While once you go to high temperature, you enter a different place where the eigenvalue distribution becomes a localized uh, distribution. Okay. It, is, it only has support uh, in some inter interval that is smaller than zero and uh, two, two pi. Now, I want to consider the microcanonical ensemble version of this quantity for the same reason that I explained for the black hole. Uh, basically here, you also have a phase transition on the real axis of beta. So if you consider the canonical ensemble quantity, there is also a phase transition that will happen on the uh, complex beta plane. Namely, if you consider this quantity and take beta to beta plus it, as some beta uh, and some t that is of order beta, this quantity will be dominated by this so-called confined phase rather than the deconfined phase. So that will not be uh, that would be a, not be a good thing. Uh, so let's say I want to focus on the high energy states. If I want to focus on the high energy states at a lower time scale, I want to consider the microcanonical ensemble quantity. So the microcanonical example is uh, just a little bit different from the canonical example in the sense that since this is a first order transition, if you plot this as a function of energy, uh, let me 
let's say this direction is increasing energy, then in a first order transition, the uh, transition temperature actually corresponds to a range of energy in the microcanonical example. So at very low energy, then the energy that is order one, uh, the eigenvalue distribution is still completely uniform. There is an intermediate range of the energy where the eigenvalue distribution has a cosine theta uh, variation. And once you increase, so at this range, the energy is, of, is already of order n squared. Once you go above a critical energy, let's say E critical, the eigenvalue distribution becomes completely, uh, becomes dead as the high, te high temperature phase, okay? So this is just a technical dif difference uh, from between canonical example and microcanonical example. But this technical difference is actually important in the analysis in my paper because the, the formulas of the matrix model in this ungapped phase is much, much simpler than the formulas in the gapped phase. So I could just focus on the uh, energy window that is before, within the range where the saddle point is ungapped and consider the special form factor. And that analysis is much simpler than you fix the energy to be higher. But of course, in the paper, I uh, discussed some evidence for similar structure in the, in the gapped phase as well, or in the deconfined phase. So what is the structure that you find in the um, spectral form vector? What you find is that these well-known saddle points in the literature, with no surprise, uh, they lead to a spectral form factor. So I, let me normalize that by divided by one over n squared. They lead to a, a spectral form factor, which also decays super, very fast. And it crosses uh, zero at the time that is of order one. For concreteness, we could consider, for example, uh, Yamil's theory on S3. Now then this, uh, this time would just be some order one number times the radius of S3. That is the only, uh, only length scale in the problem. And um, so the, uh, the initial decay is given by this, this set of points that, that dominate at t equals to zero. For example, it could be this gapped solution, or it could be uh, in the intermediate range of the energy would be this uh, solution with a cosine theta variation. But in, in this gauge theory, you could explicitly find other set of points that start to dominate at a later time. For example, so the, the full story is more complicated and I don't want to go into that here. But for example, what could happen is that there can be a rising contribution which corresponds to a, a eigenvalue distribution that is a multi-cut uh, uh, eigenvalue distribution, or so this will be correspond to that phase. And in terms of this phase, it will be a solution with a cosine two theta variation. Okay? So this is a cosine theta variation. This is cosine two theta variation. And more generally, depend on how you choose the uh, energy window delta, how you choose the energy, there can be other phase as well. For example, a three car solution or a cosine three theta variation. And in this phase, well, the eigenvalue distribution is ungapped, you can actually correct, uh, classify all these set of points fairly easily. But in this phase, uh, I only provided some preliminary result because the formulas are more complicated. Um, and now this, um, these different set of points, they uh, can be distinguished by saying that they preserve different CN symmetry of the uh, CN subgroup of the center symmetry. So that, that is just a way to distinguish them based on uh, some symmetry. Um, and now I want to conclude this discussion uh, by saying that it is, I think it's an interesting question to ask what, what, now, what, what changes once you turn on the uh, coupling. So um, we don't know, for example, even the, even the saddle point at t equals zero, I don't think we know whether there is a phase transition in terms of the two hook coupling. Uh, once you, you uh, go from free theory to uh, strong coupling limit, 
the reason you want to understand strong coupling limit is, of course, because it's directly related to the whole. Um, but I think it's an interesting question to ask what happens at weak coupling. So once you turn on a little bit of coupling, this saddle point should still be there. Of course, the detail will be modified a little bit. But in, in, a, in this gauge theory, we expect that even once you have a little bit of uh, weak coupling, at a long, at long enough time, there should be a, some notion of chaos that start to emerge. Uh, the, the level statistic will be will look more like random matrix at, at when the when you look look at the finer and finer detail, then they are longer and longer time. So a, an interesting question that I have understood is whether that requires some completely new phenomena or they can somehow arise from this settle point that uh, I discussed in the paper. Um, okay, I, I guess that's what I have. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to comment. There's a 2006 paper by Festucia and Hong Liu that uh, claimed to study uh, just first order perturbation theory or lowest order perturbation theory in the Yang-Mills coupling. And they claim that the behavior in the part of the spectrum uh, where the free energy is a border n squared changes dramatically as soon as you turn on the coupling, that there is a, basically the degeneracies get lifted by something that they call a sparse random matrix. And there's a uh, there's very different long time behavior as soon as lambda is turned on. So, I see. Yes, yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. I agree that uh, a long time it should be very different from the free theory. I think it's just uh, using this language. I wonder whether you can gradually see how that emerges from this picture, or does it require a completely different structure. So basically, um, their argument was that if you just do degenerate perturbation theory to lowest order, mm -hmm. that you already see at any non-zero value of lambda, you see something that's completely different. And I, I'm not sure that it could, I, I, I can't comment on whether it could come from a small modification of your uh, classical solution or not, but it, it does seem quite dramatically different. Um, okay, so uh, I will read that paper. Okay. It's a paper by Liu and Stucha. Okay, okay, I'll check it out. Your discussion is the times of order one, right? Yes, time of order of course, one. That sounds like it would be a times of order one over G. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in the case of strings, like uh, so you said, like uh, there are like infinitely many poles contributing. Yes. And and I just wanted to make sure that in the case of gauge theory, depending on the energy, you do you, do you have like infinitely many? Yeah. In, in the gauge theory, there are also an infinite number of saddles. Okay. Um, it depends also on the detailed structure, which free theory you are looking at. Let's say you consider the. Uh, yeah, mu theory on S3, mm -hmm. since all the energies on S3 are integer, uh, integer mm -hmm. spaced, uh, the spectral form factor has to be a periodic function. Mm -hmm. So basically all the saddle points, they uh, repeat themselves in time. Um, but you could consider the free theory on some other manifold, then you will not have a periodicity. And in that case, there will be infinite many different saddle points that start to appear in the spectral form factor. So in free theory, of course, it, it should this discussion should hold for all time scale. Uh, the question is just once you have a little bit of interaction, at what time scale it breaks down and how it breaks down. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank you again.